Welcome to the Books and Travel podcast. I'm Jo Francis Penn, thriller and dark fantasy author, bringing you escape and inspiration about unusual and fascinating places, as well as the deeper side of books and travel. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my ebooks for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. Hello, travellers. I'm Jo Francis Penn, and today I have an interview with Richard Zimler that spans aspects of travel and faith. There are some books that remain with you over time, that spark the imagination and echo down the years of your life. I read The Last Kabbalist of Lisbon by Richard Zimler in the late 1990s, around the time I also read The Name of the Rose by Umberto Eco, while I was studying theology at Oxford University, which I talked about in episode 12. The themes and the characters of those two books still resonate in my own writing and I write about Kabbalah, I write about travel and faith and all of this and the very idea of faith soaking into the stones of a place is something that stays with me as I travel for my own book research and uh, I write about this a lot. I feel a great sensitivity to places where people have worshipped or people have died, uh, these very, very sort of emotional places in the world. So when I visited Lisbon in Portugal in autumn 2019, I wrote an article about my weekend there and I mentioned Richard's book and he contacted me and I'm a total fangirl. So I'm thrilled to be able to share this interview with you today. Richard's books span the history of a Jewish family across the diaspora, as well as writing historical fiction set in the time of Jesus and more modern tales of people of faith in different parts of the world. Our discussion, like his writing, is both political and religious. Yes, we delve into some of those topics today. You just can't avoid it. (laughs) And hopefully our discussion will spark thoughts around your own position. For only by truly listening to others can we formulate what we really think. So let's get into the interview with Richard. Richard Zimler is the multi-award winning author of 10 novels, as well as writing poetry, short film, children's books and song lyrics. Richard is American, but lives in Portugal. And in 2017, he was awarded the Medal of Honor by the city of Porto. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so, and I was having a little fangirl moment before we started recording, but I'm I'm just so thrilled to have you on the sh- on the show. Um, so, you clearly love Portugal, um, and so tell us, as an you know, as an American, why the country still inspires you after so many years. Um, it's my home, first of all. I've lived here for 29 years, so most of my friends are here. My life partner is here. I've, we've lived together for 40 years, so it really is, you know, the center of my world. And I'm glad about that. I love Portugal. Uh, it's become a better and better place to live. Uh, for people visiting and for people who live here, it's it's got a lot of pluses. One would be uh, it's a small country. You know, we're not talking about the United States or Brazil, so you can drive from the top to the very bottom in about seven hours. It's a very varied place. Think about California. We've got mountains, you know, very forbidding peaks in the northeast of the country in what we call the Trazuj Monch, the beyond the beyond the mountains. Uh, we've got, you know, beautiful sandy long beaches in the south and all along the coast. Uh, Isolated little t- mountain top towns, almost like Italy, you know, all stone towns, cobblestones everywhere, little cafes. Um, so visitors and, and people who do live here uh, take advantage of that. You know, I travel around Lisbon to Porto is about two hours and 40 minutes by train, three hours by car. Those are the two main cities. Uh, we go into the countryside quite a lot. We have a house in what's in what's called the Minho, a very green province in the north of the country where there's wine growing. Um, And so I love that varied aspect of of Portugal. Um, It's also really great to be here now because it's it's become a refuge in a sense from right wing 
intolerance and bigotry in a lot of European countries and in my homeland in, in America. Uh, Portugal has a progressive government. In recent years, well, since 2010, for instance, we've had gay marriage. Uh, we've had medically assisted reproduction for single women, for gay women. Um, you know, we're moving forward into, you know, almost uncharted territory. We have the best, most intelligent drug policy in the world. Mm -hmm. um, small possession and small use of drugs, marijuana, LSD, things like that, is all decriminalized. If you have a problem with drugs, you're an addict, you don't go into the criminal justice system. You get shifted directly over to health care. And what this has meant in part is crime is way down. Uh, HIV infection is way down. HIV infections have been lowered by more than 90 percent. And people have come from all over the world to study Portugal's drug uh, policy because it's so much more intelligent than the, the war being led by America and Mexico and the South American countries. Um, so I love living in a progressive country. I love living in a country that's getting better and easier and giving more options to its people. For instance, uh, half our medical students, half our law students are women now. Um, so, our, you know, we're moving up in science um, and innovation. We've just hosting the Web Summit now, which is this gigantic international event of techies. Um, so it seems to me like it's a great place to live. Yeah. Well, I'm so glad you mentioned these things. And th there is, uh, as you were saying, I was like, wow, there really is a cultural, like almost an emotional difference between um, the US and, you know, let's put the UK in there as well, uh, yeah. and Portugal. Uh, it does it does actually seem quite an, an emotional, intelligent place. Would that be a, a, a good way <laughs> to describe yeah, well, it? I, and, and, you know, we've been resistance, resistant to far-right populist politics, which have taken over the UK and America. Um, I'm not really sure why that's happened. It doesn't mean that it'll happen forever. We've all got to be vigilant about that. And, um, you know, we have one member of the parliament now who's from a far right party. So that's a worry that they've got their foot in the door. Um, but perhaps because Portugal had its revolution only recently in 1974. Before that, it was a dictatorship for almost 50 years. And before that, we had the Inquisition for 240 years. So there's a great, uh, you know, there's a great resentment here. Uh, among a lot of people for governments that want to censor our books and control our lives and tell us what to do in our bedroom. Uh, I think a great many Portuguese don't want that and are vigilant about that. And and they don't understand America. You know, when Trump was elected, um, my phone rang off the hook because I can speak Portuguese fluently and I've lived here a long time. So all the news channels wanted to interview me about how this could happen, how someone ignorant and racist and xenophobic could get elected. And, and so, um, you know, the Portuguese have a hard time understanding America and, and Britain, too. They just don't get Boris Johnson. They just <laughs> can't see what makes him popular among people because from a distance, I'm, I don't want to, you know, ridicule anyone, but from a distance, he seems, you know, uh, incompetent and foolish. And that's what the Portuguese regard him as. Mm, it is. It is so interesting. So, of course, uh, as you mentioned, uh, the modern side of Portugal is this very liberal, um, tolerant place. But you mentioned the Inquisition there and uh, your book, The Last Kabbalist of Lisbon, which I read many years ago and reread recently in preparation for this interview. Is, it's set in 1506 during a massacre of Jews in the city by the Catholic Inquisition. And, um, you know, uh, as I've mentioned to you, my husband is Jewish and wow. we stood in Rossio Square, which is, you know, there's a McDonald's and it's all very very you know, touristy. And I recalled your words from the book about the geography of death. And right. so give us the other side, because it wasn't always this modern place. And, and what about the darker side of places draws you for your writing? You're quite right. I mean, Portugal did have a very dark history, particularly in regard to its Jews, but not only. I mean, it took part in, in slavery. There were slave ships. Um, so there's a very dark side to Portuguese history. Um, I guess what attracts me are two things. The first is 
Um, I have a very subversive personality. I don't know whether I was born this way or became this way, uh, but I'm happy to have it. And so when I found out about the massacre that you refer to in which 2000 forcibly converted Jews, we call them new Christians or conversos or moranos, when these 2000 forcibly converted Jews were murdered and burnt in the Rocio in the main square that you mentioned. And this had been completely forgotten, whitewashed and forgotten. No one knew about it. And I mean, there was a few specialists in the area of Jewish history that had mentioned this in the books, but 99% of the population knew nothing. So, you know, when I found out about the massacre, I asked my friends who were tenure track professors and doctors and lawyers and architects. And I said, what do you know about the massacre? Nobody knew anything. And I thought, no, no, I can't let this go on. I, I have a responsibility. Um, to literature, to, to, to the Jewish past, to Portuguese history, to say something about this. And so that was part of the inspiration uh, uh, for, for the last Kabbalist to Lisbon. Um, and then the second part of this is, I guess I'm drawn to darker subjects because as one of the characters in one of my novels, The, the Night Watchman says, uh, he's a detective and he says he usually sees people on the worst day of their life. And and that's OK to him, strangely enough. He's a bit perverse because people are more authentic. They're more fragile. They're more needy when these dark things happen. And he he likes that. He likes seeing people at their most truthful, honest times. And I think I'm the same way. Um, you know, when I write about the Inquisition, when I write about people who've been betrayed, um, it's no time for a inauthentic personality. It's no time to be phony. You, you, you're called upon to be yourself, whatever that is, whether you're intolerant or cruel or wonderful or generous. These dark times force us to be ourselves. And I think as a novelist, that's uh, that's something that, that really attracts me. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's interesting because exactly what you say about the Portuguese empire, because of course in um in Lisbon there there's this big sculpture with, you know, the sort of the travelers heading out. And as as you say, they went out and there's the slave trade and they kind of yeah. there, there's some lots of massacres that are just not uh really documented. I've been reading no. some of the history of the Portuguese Empire going Okay, why why is this less famous than say the Spanish Inquisition right. um, or the British Raj or you know some right. of these other historical things? So um, and people listening might not know. So what are some of the surprising places that the Portuguese uh, kind of ended up? Either the the Jews as part of the diaspora or the empire. Well, you know, that's a wonderful thing for me as well as a writer of historical novels, because I can practically put my finger anywhere on the map and find a connection to Portugal and sometimes even to Portuguese Jewish history, which I love. So, you know, they went to America that, you know, the first Jewish community in the United States wasn't in New York. It was in Charleston, South Carolina. And most of them were Sephardic Jews from Portugal, Sephardic Jews being those Jews from Portugal and Spain. Uh, they obviously went to Brazil. They call, colonized Brazil. Um, they went to India. They had three different colonies in India, uh, in Goa, which was the main one, but also Diu and the Mang. They went all the way to Macau, which until recently belonged to the Portuguese. And in, they went to Malacca in Malaysia and Timor in Indonesia. Um, obviously, they were in Africa as well, Mozambique, Angola. Um, so they had forts all over the world. And Portugal itself, because of that, became a crossroads for these different color uh, cultures. Uh, I remember while researching the Les Cabals to live in Lisbon, I came upon a quote from a visiting priest who said that Portugal, because of all the black and white people, you know, the people of different colors looked like a chessboard. Um, you know, so we had people here from not just slaves, but of course we had slaves from Portugal and what they used to call mulattoes, you know, people uh, with both uh, uh, white and black heritage, uh, but Indians, um, uh, Brazilian Indians, uh, you know, and of course, bringing all their different cultural uh, objects, cultural phenomena. So, you know, Portuguese cuisine, um, is very influenced by India, by Goa. A lot of people, it's not unusual for people to hear eat curry, for instance, on a weekend, you know, as their special family meal. Um, 
and tropical fruits. You know, everybody here, long before they came to America, uh, was eating mangoes and papayas because that was part of the African heritage and the Brazilian heritage. Um, language also, Portuguese uh, and variants of Portuguese are spoken in, in all over the world, especially in Brazil, a country of 200 million people. And it's it's great now that I speak Portuguese to go to Brazil because it's strange. You know, they speak with a different accent and the, some of the words and slang are different, but it feels strangely like my home. It's surreal. I guess it's it's like a, an English person visiting America or Ireland or an American visiting Ireland. You, you, you feel like there's a linguistic cultural connection, even though it's quite different. And um, and all this comes out in my novels because I have one, for instance, Guardian of the Dawn that takes place in Goa during the Inquisition because, unfortunately, the Portuguese exported this religious dictatorship to India and persecuted the small Jewish community, but mainly Hindus, uh, all the way from 1560 until 1820. Um, so I have books set there. I have others set in America and um, – you know, in Porto, in Lisbon, and they go to Brazil. And so, you know, for me, it's wonderful. It gives me so many different options. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And and I think that's why I was drawn to your books um, early on. And uh, I also write books that kind of go through religious history. So I, I find this so Bye. interesting. So your, your latest book is, um, as we record this in 2019, is The yes. Gospel According to Lazarus, which is a historical novel written from the perspective of the, I guess, the biblical Lazarus. So yes. this is this is a fascinating topic to choose. So how does faith influence your travel and how do you research a book set, you know, thousands of years ago in what is right. now a very modern country? Yeah. I mean, I'll start with the second part first, the research. Um, it's something I love. Um, I feel that I'm good at it. I, now that I've written, you know, 10, 10 novels, I feel like I know how to do this. Uh, with the internet, it's easier because I can enter a keyword like um, Holy Land, uh, Jesus, uh, Daily Life. And a whole list of books will come that will tell me about what people ate and what kind of clothes they wore and how they built their houses and what the main cities were and what languages they spoke. And so what I do is I buy those books. Uh, you know, for me, it's an investment. So maybe I spend a couple hundred uh, euros or pounds and I order everything I can find. And that's what I did in this case. As I say, I'm mostly interested in daily life. Um, so all those questions that we would have about living in a different time period, like what, what, what was the role of women back then? You know, were they allowed to leave the house? Were they allowed to have jobs? Um, how about kids? How did parents relate to their kids? Were kids meant to be seen and not heard? Or did they go to school? What kind of schools did they have? And so I love researching this. It's not a sacrifice at all. So in the case of the gospel, according to Lazarus, I spent the first six months reading everything I could find, taking copious notes. Um, I love mythology, so I needed to find out about Roman mythology, Jewish mythology, Greek mythology, because what I discovered was that the Holy Land back then was very much a multicultural society. We tend to think of multiculturalism as this uh, controversial topic for, for now. But back then, um, if you were a shop owner in Jerusalem and you would have had to have spoken at least you know, basically three different languages. You'd have to speak Latin, you'd have to speak Aramaic, which was the language of the Jews, and probably you'd have to speak some Greek and maybe some other languages like Phoenician as well. You'd have to know a, little, a few words in that to help your customers. So um, I love finding out about those things. I love finding out little strange facts. For instance, um, I remember I was reading a book about archaeology and the discovery of an amphora, you know, a Greek vessel, clay vessel, which had uh, kosher garum. Garum was a fermented fish sauce that the Romans adored, that they would add to all their different foods. Mm. Uh, apparently very smelly, a bit like, uh, you know, Cambodian or Thai fish sauce now. And the fact that they would have made kosher fish sauce, in other words, fit for the consumption of religious Jews, um, meant you know, to me as a novelist, that there had to be a market for that. So there had to be enough Jews living in Jerusalem that were what I call Romanized or Latinized, that, that, that had followed the customs 
of the empire, you know, that lived like like Romans that wore togas and ate their food and spoke Latin. Um, and so there's a character in my book, in my book, Lucius, who's one of these Latinized Jews. And he's a very curious character and has an interesting relationship with Lazarus, who's a mosaic maker and who's building this huge, beautiful mosaic at the bottom of Lucius's swimming pool. Um, so, you know, the, it, I don't really know the plot of my novels or even much about the characters until, the, until I do the research, because mm -hmm. how, how could I decide, you know, who Lazarus was and how he related to Jesus and what his difficulties were and, um, you know, how his two sisters lived? Because we know from the gospel, according to John, that Lazarus was Jesus's beloved friend and that Jesus was friends with Lazarus's two sisters. So I start my novel with this presumption that they were friends from childhood. That seemed to me a natural conclusion from what the Gospel of John says. Um, and so I do the research and then the plot and the characters come out of that. And then, and then I start to write. Uh, in terms of faith, um, you know, I'm not a practicing Jew. I'm not a practicing Christian, but I do believe there's a transcendent reality. I consider myself uh, a Jewish mystic. I believe I've read everything I can about Kabbalah, which is the branch of Jewish mysticism that started in the Middle Ages back in the 10th or 11th century in what's now southern France and from there spread out to the rest of the Jewish diaspora. Um, I think Kabbalah has a lot to teach us. Uh, about ourselves and the world that's useful to me. And that came in handy because in my version of, of the Lazarus story, Jesus, whom I call Yeshua ben Yosef, I call him by his Hebrew name, um, is, is a Jewish mystic. The earliest form of mysticism that we know about in the Holy Land is called Merkava mysticism, Merkava being the chariot of Ezekiel. Those of you who remember your Bible know in your Old Testament that Ezekiel, this prophet, saw a chariot riding in the sky. He had a vision. And, um, and it, the, the Merkava mystics used the language of the Old Testament and that vision to describe their inner experiences, to describe moving into an ecstatic state. Um, so in my version of the events, Yeshua is a Merkava mystic, uh, a very extraordinary, charismatic individual. And in the very first scene, Lazarus rises from the dead. But he's very disoriented, very fragile, doesn't know what's happened to him. And he's worst of all, he's lost his faith. He was always he always believed that he would see God or something of an afterlife angels, but he doesn't remember anything. So he decides that he needs to speak to his best friend, his dearest friend from childhood, Yeshua ben Yosef, about this experience and about what it means. So the two men, these two old friends, embark on a new phase of their friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, it happens that he's awakened. He's come back to life at the worst possible moment when Jesus is going to face Passion Week. And, and so the book becomes the story of these two men and the sacrifices they make for each other. Um, it's about what, how we go on after suffering a huge trauma. And I'm, I've been really pleased by the reactions of readers who've told me, for instance, that the crucifixion scene in my book is the most moving version they've ever read. So that's been extremely gratifying to me. Mm. And it, it's fascinating because, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, I, I guess you're you're um, I guess, well, you're not a secular Jew because, as you say, you you, you are a Kabbalist right. mystic, but equally um, you're not a, a Christian in that, um, right. you know, people who write about uh, Jesus are often Christ from the Christian tradition. So this is a, quite a different angle, I think, on, oh, on, absolutely. on that I story. You know, if I had to, you know, characterize the book in just one sentence, I say I, I've written a mystical book about deep friendship and sacrifice. And that's a Jewish version of the Passion Week, a Jewish version of the story of Lazarus and Yeshua. And I was worried, of course, that people would react negatively to this because we each have our own ideas about who Jesus was and who Lazarus was and how they should be written about. And But happily, a very few people have been, been negative about the book. Most people have written me beautiful, beautiful emails um, saying how much the story moved them and how, how different it was. You know, one reviewer 
um, in the Times said he, uh, that I did the impossible. I turned the whole last part of the book into a page turner. You know, he never figured <laughs> that the story of Lazarus would become a page turner. So, you know, I, it's been I was worried at first, but it, but I've been pleasantly surprised by how sensitive and intelligent most readers are. Mm. So I want to I kind of circle back to this sense of place um, yeah. because I, I I've been to Israel like eleven times and wow. it's, <laughs> yeah it's, it's come up in a lot of my books and I've been traveling there I guess since I was fifteen so um, you know twenty five years and it's a place that I I have many deep and meaningful thoughts about sure. um, and and yet it's a place that is so difficult in many many ways. Do you feel when you're in a place because you've written about a lot of very right. resonant spiritual places. Right. Um, do you think that the years of history, belief, and let's say blood in places like mm -hmm. Rossio Square and in yeah. Jerusalem, you know, there's a lot of blood in Jerusalem. Do Absolutely. you think that it impacts a place so that when you travel there as a writer, you're kind of sensitive to that? Well, you know, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think Israel in particular brings up really deep emotions in a lot of people. They have so much of their own spiritual life invested in Jerusalem and in the Holy Land that when they're there, or even when you just bring up the subject of Israel, it, you get this emotional outburst. So it's almost impossible, I've discovered, to discuss, for instance, current Policy, the current policies of the Israeli government or the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's very difficult to, dis, to discuss these, these topics with people because everybody is so invested in their own perspective. Um, and it can even be Jews or Christians who've never even visited Israel, but they're so caught up in the mythology, in the symbolism, you know, for Jews, every, you know, we, we always say at Passover, you know, next year in Jerusalem. And so it means like Jerusalem is the promised land. And so for that country to be in a state of conflict is, is just even more distressing and terrible for a great many people. Uh, and I think, you know, for the Portuguese, it, it's not Jerusalem, obviously. It's um places like the Rocio that you mentioned, because it's the main square in their capital city. So it does have a resonance for Portuguese people. And I think even for other Portuguese speakers from Brazil or, or for even from Mozambique, th there's a resonance to certain places like the Torre do Belém, you know, the Belém Tower, from which the Portuguese discoveries set off for India, for America. Um, these places are imbued with such deep emotions. And it's, again, it's so difficult to discuss them rationally because, you know, there's this discussion now in Portugal that's become very controversial about building a museum of the discoveries. And even just the title, what do you call it? Were they really discoveries? I mean, the, the, the Native Americans in Brazil and America knew, knew they existed long yeah. before Columbus got there. Or, you know, the people in India knew they were Hindus and Muslims long before, uh, you know, Vasco da Gama settled there. So do we call them the discoveries? What do we call them? And how do you... Um, present documentation about them. How do you discuss slavery? How do you discuss col colonization? It's becoming hugely controversial here with a great deal of resentment uh, on both sides. You know, the people on the right want to characterize colonization as this wonderful, heroic, courageous adventure. And it was. I mean, people were extremely courageous. And yet, for the indigenous populations, it was a total catastrophe. So, from my point of view, it's not either or. You know, I have the point of view of a novelist. You have to present as best you can the different perspectives. If you have seven different characters in a novel, you want to each give give each of their perspectives on a dramatic topic. Um, and so in my museum of the discoveries, I would have everything. You know, I would have the courage of the people setting out for India in 1520, but I would always also have you know, the Inquisition and the disaster that it was for the Hindus who were forced to convert and then burnt at the stake in acts of faith in these autos de fe, which were these great celebrations where they would uh, ceremonially strangle 
uh, people and burn them. Um, and but you know these are as you say there are certain locales that are so imbued with emotion that it's 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 very it's very difficult to not uh, either offend to offend certain people when you write about them. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure. Well, this has come to another book that I was interested in, which is the search for Sana, which is right. about a Palestinian woman, and it's exactly what you're you're saying. It's um, you know, perhaps it's part of your subversive personality. I mean, right. it, this is an inherently political um, book in that a Jewish man. Uh, writing about a Palestinian woman, um, which, you know, and your characters are fantastic. And you do, many of your characters come from these different perspectives. So how how can we kind of transcend our expectations and our historical baggage and travel with an open mind to kind of see that other side? I think, you know, that's another excellent question. I think as a writer, uh, we have to train ourselves to do that. We have to train ourselves to enter into the skin of our different characters, whether they're, you know, uh, in, in the search for Sana, whether it's a Palestinian dancer who's 40 years old and who's this incredibly gifted, uh, beautiful person who's, who's, who's wonderful relationship with her best friend, a Jewish woman from Haifa, comes undone because of this conflict between the two people. So I have I had to enter into Sana and see the conflict between the two peoples from her perspective, see her childhood with her best friend from her perspective. I think that's one of the keys to becoming a good writer. Can can you do that or not? Because if you can't do that, you're going to have a really difficult time writing anything that's beyond your own experience, beyond your own views on all the great topics, your own view of sexuality, of friendship, of war. Um, and so I think that's a challenge for every every good writer. Um, how do we do it? I think, you know, living in Portugal for 29 years has given me some insight about that because when I first came here in 1990 to live, I thought everybody, very naively, very stupidly, I thought that everybody thought the same way about all the big topics. You know, um, everybody viewed the role of a teacher and the role of a student the same way. Every thought, Everybody thought about uh, how, the ideal relationship between a man and a woman or a man and a man the same way. Um, that everybody had the same perspective on what we want in a government, what's a good government. And, you know, after a very short time in Portugal, I realized that's just not true. The Portuguese think very, very differently about all the big and small topics than an American. Uh, to give you an example, private life. You know, in America, if you're running for political office and possibly in the UK and Ireland as well and a lot of countries, if you're running for political office, everybody wants to know about your relationship with your wife and where your kids go to school and are your kids on drugs? Are they good students? Um, did you ever do anything wrong when you were in college? Like like Justin Trudeau and this controversy about him wearing blackface. You have to expose everything you've ever done in your life for scrutiny. Mm. And that's considered OK in the United States and proper because everybody regard or most people regard it as as true that there's a direct correlation between your private life and between your past life and your capacity to run a country or represent uh, your constituency. And the Portuguese don't think that way. They don't think that you should have to talk about your private life at all if you're running for public office. So here, you know, the prime minister, who, whom, whom we know quite well, um, he you know, he never has to talk about his wife or his kids. Never. No one even asks him about that. It's just not considered the right thing to do. And it wouldn't be considered relevant. What what more would we gain by knowing that one of his kids is divorced? Uh, you know, it, it's inconceivable to the Portuguese that that would have a relevancy. And so in many ways, I've had to accept that there are there are different perspectives on every big topic. And so I'm not right about everything. It's forced me to doubt all those opinions and all those preconceived notions that I've had. And I think that as people visiting a foreign country, you know, when I travel, um, that's been really helpful. 
because, you know, if I'm in Thailand, if I'm in Australia, if I'm in Brazil and people do things that seem odd to me, you know, how they serve breakfast or, you know, how they honk in their cars or I, I, I've stopped thinking that those are wrong, that those are bad things, that those are things people shouldn't do. Um, maybe they still bother me. But I, I've come to the conclusion that if I grew up there, I'd probably be the same way. And that maybe in the circumstances they're living in, their way of thinking about sexuality and friendship and technology and what people should talk about in public, that their views of all that make a lot of sense to them, that it, they're not wrong. They're not worse than me. They're not simpler. They're, they're just as complex. And, um, and so I think if we can have that openness, and I think if we can recognize that people really do think differently about everything that's important, uh, we become better visitors, we become more open, more compassionate, have more so solidarity and empathy with the people that we're meeting and talking to. Mm, I love that being a better visitor. I think that's that is a great way to travel. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> we put on a t-shirt. Be a better visitor. Be a but, better um, visitor. Yeah. <laughs> we are you, almost, we're almost out of time, and I really wanted to ask you this question because I, you know, having you know read bits uh, bits of all your books now, but um, and several uh, completely. Um, many of your books feature birds in oh, yes. some form, either in dreams or in manuscripts or as part of the right. story. So wh what is it about birds that um, draw you in your writing? You know, um, authors often reveal a lot about their personal psychology and past history um, without meaning to, or maybe they do mean to. So everybody, every author has a certain eccentricities. You know, Philip Roth talks a lot about baseball and, you know, I talk about birds and, um, and I think it's because, you know, I, when I was a little kid, I wanted to fly and I always thought birds were beautiful. I was a crazed bird watcher. You know, I'd wander around our small town for hours, just trying to find blue jays and orioles and, um, chickadees. And so, you know, it was, it was, um, it was part of my life. And, Curiously enough, I think birds have a long history of symbolism in mystical literature. There's a wonderful epic poem written by a Sufi mystic in the Middle Ages called The Conference of the Birds, written by a man named Attar, A-T-T-A-R. And um, all the characters are birds. And, um, and so it goes back all the way to the Greeks. You know, we, we have the birds, one of the most famous Greek plays that we have, uh, where the there's hoopos and other, other kind, other species. Um, and so I think humanity has always wondered how we can get beyond the limitations of our earthly existence. And so flight has attracted us because it's symbolic of the ability to go beyond our limitations. And so in my novels, a lot of the characters feel the way I do, and their visions come to them in the form of birds, and bird feathers uh, remind them of their past, of their childhood adventures. Um, and so it's just part of my eccentricity, part of, part of the way I feel. Yeah, and I, I think it, it resonates with travelers, because, you know, we, we look oh, up uh, and we see the, the birds flying off in the winter. <laughs> And as a bird watcher, you know, I love to go to foreign countries, particularly tropical countries, and see the amazing birds they have. I mean, that's one of my my thrills in going places. Oh, fantastic. Right. So apart from your own books, what are a couple of books that you would recommend um, about Portugal or set in Portugal or that people sure. might not have heard of? Yeah. First one, there's a Portuguese author from 1950s, 60s, 70s called Miguel Torga, T-O-R-G-A. He was mostly a short story writer, um, and he's got two books that have been translated into English, Tales from the Mountain and More Tales from the Mountain, both of which I would highly recommend. Most of his stories are set in the rugged you know, outback of the country in mountainous regions, poor people living in a very harsh environment, uh, suffering, you know, the tri trials of childbirth and hunger. And I think for people who want to get a feel 
for how Portugal was and still is in its most isolated places, uh, Miguel Torga is the author to go to. I love his writing. It's very succinct, very concise, very powerful, and, um, and I really love it. Uh, another author, uh, a classical Portuguese novelist, is Essa de Queiroz, uh, Essa being E-C with a cedilla A, de Queiroz, who spoke English fluently. He was a consul in England for a while. Um, his probably best and most well-known novel is called The Mayas, M-A-I-A-S. It's a family, and it's a, it takes place in the last part of the 19th century, and it's about the decline and destruction of a bourgeois Portuguese family. And so it's a critique, in a sense, of all that was worst in Portugal, you know, the backbiting, the the pettiness, um, the bigotry. And so I, I think that would be a great novel for people who want to to read a classic author and discover, um, you know, what 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 living in Portugal in the 19th century might have been like. And then I would recommend a couple poets. We have some great, great poets here. Uh, the most well-known, of course, is Fernando Pessoa. And there's a lot of translations of his work. But I would also recommend some more contemporary authors. One of my favorites was an old friend of mine from Porto, Eugenio de Andrade. Um, Andrade is A-N-D-R-A-D-E. Almost everything he had is translated. He, uh, his poetry is very powerful, very, very succinct very abbreviated, um, always seems to choose the right expression, the right words, uh, difficult to translate because of that, but, but well worth finding. I translated a book by uh, a contemporary poet named Alberto, B-E-R-T-O, uh, called The Secret Life of Images, and each of the poems is about a different artist. So it goes all the way back to people like Giotto, and all the way forward to people like Chagall, um, the, the poem about Chagall and his flying brides. For anybody who remembers Chagall's paintings uh, about these two, br the bride and the groom flying through the air in different paintings of his. Um, I would definitely recommend that book by Alberto. And then, strangely enough, I'd also recommend the lyrics of Portuguese songs, you know, they use a lot of classical poetry and modern poetry in the, in the Fado songs. Fado is the Portuguese tradition of melancholy, sad songs. Um, and the greatest Fado singer was Amalia Rodriguez. And um, I would get, you know, her greatest hits. But we also have a lot of contemporary Fado singers like Cristina Branco and Mizia and Ana Mora and Ricardo Ribeiro. It can be men or women. And if you get their their CDs or download their music, um, you know, listen to their lyrics, because um, not all of them are great, but some of them are very moving and wonderful. Amalia Rodriguez particularly has some extremely moving songs like Barco Negro, which is, uh, you know, Black Ship uh, or Que Estranha Forma de Vida, What a Strange Way of Life. And Amalia was one of the greatest, greatest singers of the, of the 20th century. So you can't go wrong with her. Wow, you've given us great resources there. That is fantastic. So uh, let people know, where can they find you and your books online? Ah, well, I think the easiest way to order my books um, is probably Book Depository. Not that many people know about it compared to Amazon. But if you go on Book Depository, Co UK or bookdepository.com, depending on where you are. Um, usually the, the, the postage costs are free. So it's a, it's a huge bargain to order my books there. It's just the cover price. And sometimes there's even a discount on that. So you save the postage that you would normally be paying on Amazon. If you happen to live in a big city like London or Dublin or New York, you can probably just go into your nearest Waterstones or Barnes & Noble or maybe even your closest independent bookshops. We want to support those independent bookshops and you can buy them there or certainly order them there. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for your time, Richard. That was great. Oh, I'm really grateful for all your help. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining me today on the Books and Travel podcast. I hope you found a moment of escape. You can find the episode show notes at booksandtravel.page. And if you enjoy thrillers set in international locations, download one of my books for free at jfpen.com forward slash free. 
Happy travels. Until next time.